welcome great expectations for sustainable corporate action, please welcome onto the stage Sanya Odebijic, partner, Shearman and Sterling London, LLP, and the panelists for this session. Please welcome Sanya. Thank you. It is such an honor to be here. I'm really thrilled. Um, our session today is Great Expectations for Sustainable Corporate Action. Um, consumers and shareholders, investors, and indeed civil society at large are expressing growing expectations related to corporate practices on issues such as gender, peace, climate, and health. So we're going to be exploring how companies and business leaders respond to this in ways that are both responsive to the increasing demands from various stakeholders while earning public trust. In other words, how can corporate commitments act for a sustainable future? I'm going to briefly introduce our panel members my name is Sonia Yudovicic. I'm a partner at Sherman & Sterling. I'm joined today by Virginie Chauvin, who is member of the executive board and the executive committee at Mazars and in charge of audit and sustainability. Also with me on stage is Katka Roy, who's an award-winning gender economist, former Global 500 global executive, programmer, data scientist, and the CEO and founder of an award-winning SaaS company called Pipeline. And joining us virtually is Fernanda Dos Costa, who is a director at Amnesty International, and she is director for gender justice, racial justice, migrants, and refugee programs. So please welcome my panel members. We're going to dive straight in. And I'm going to start with Virginie, if that's OK. Um, Virginie, you know, this is obviously something that you're spending a lot of time on at the moment. And I'd like you to explain to us a little bit as to why you think that there are greater expectations these days on sustainability. I mean, in, in the past, it's been P&L, the bottom line. That's how corporates have been measured on their, on their competitiveness. What's changing? Thank you, Sonia. So yes, at uh, Mazars, as a consulting and audit firm, we are doing a lot of surveys. So we've done what? Uh, where we noticed that this is, there is a very high society expectation on sustainability, and in particular, on the role of the corporates. So it appears that 81% of the respondents said that corporate are the best one just after individuals to make things change for sustainability. The second reason why is that there is a real awareness that change is not happening naturally. So before the sanitary crisis, there were already changes, but there has been a real acceleration during the last two years. And in our CISUT barometers of last year, 62% of respondents answered that they were changing in their strategy for sustainability. It's 19 points in addition to the previous year. Another reason is that uh, we are all working with young generation and to attract talents, we need to accelerate because they have a very, very high expectation and they will choose the corporate where they're going to work by their sustainability commitments. And last but not least, sustainability is really key to reinforce trust and we all need trust for financial stability, to attract Talents were key for performance, but also for social peace and even for democracy. So it's really key. Thanks, Virginie. Um, it's really interesting to hear about the results of the surveys. And um, the, we'll hear later on about some of the actions that this is prompting. Can I ask, Fernanda, you know, you're coming from outside the corporate world. In your, from your perspective, how can companies and business leaders respond 
in ways that meet these very high expectations that they're hearing from stakeholders? And how can they build public confidence in their actions? Sure. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you for having me here. Um, I think companies, of course, have the responsibility to respect human rights wherever they operate, including throughout the, the operations and supply chain. Uh, and we know uh, we have documented a lot of cases in which companies have been causing an, in, an impact directly, for example, dumping toxic, toxic waste or spills in the Amazonian, or through the, the or contributing to an impact or creating impact indirectly, for example, through the supply chain. And I'll give you an example of this. In 2020, Amnesty International documented a that cattle illegally grazed in protected areas of Brazil's Amazon rainforest have entered the supply chain of the world's largest meat packer. Now, how can companies contribute to create change and sustainability? Well, the first one is, for example, uh, to uh, the, after this revelation, the investment arm of Northern Europe's largest financial service group dropped this meat packer company from its portfolio, and it was the biggest one. This is because that decision was taken because this meat giant had links to the deforestation, which of course contributes to climate change, and we've all seen those horrible scenes about it. So this is a very concrete way that companies can contribute, and they are leaders, of course, to sustainability and, and meet those high expectations. There are United Nations guiding principles on, on business and human rights that, that create the responsibility for companies to have a due diligence process. It's, it's an ongoing and proactive process, so companies can identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how they address their impacts on human rights. Although they are not mandatory in most parts of the world, they, companies can achieve and, and incorporate those accountability mechanisms as a way to show to the public how committed they are to take into account all the supply chain of their operations and how human rights and environmental friendly those operations are. Thanks, Fernanda. Um, this very much accords with um, actions that we're seeing in, in our work as well. We do a lot of infrastructure financing, and we see that financiers are really imposing obligations on their borrowers to look right through their supply chains and make sure that best ESG standards are applied all the way through. They're being required to make sure that those requirements go all the way through in a very transparent way. So, Katika, can I move on to you? Um, what do you think, which actions do you think need to be implemented by government and by organizations in order to help sustainable corporate involvement? So we, we often think about issues like climate change or gender equity as different siloed issues. But in actual fact, gender equity cuts across all of those issues, including climate change. Uh, in the United States, we actually just had the 2022 midterm elections. <laughs> I published a voting guide which actually looked at 15 campaign issues through the lens of gender equity, and one of those is climate change. Women are 80% of climate change refugees, and yet they are only about 25% of the conversation around solutions for climate change. So we have a really huge gap between the folks that are actually impacted by climate change uh, and the voices that are in the room. Just to give you a really um, ground, boots on the ground example, uh, in, after Hurricane Katrina, two years after Hurricane Katrina, 83% of single moms could not return to their homes. And so the corporations, need to, we have enough awareness, quite frankly, uh, what we actually need is execution. And I'll give you an example on gender equity specifically. 96% of companies put gender equity in their top priorities. Only 22% of employees regularly see that shared and measured. So there's a 74 point gap between what companies say is important 
and their employer branding and the actual employee experience. That's what we need to close. So we need to go from commitments, which are great, to actual, execu to actual execution. So that looks like really shifting the system from inequitable by default to equitable by design. And we do that by actually ensuring that all of the people decisions that we make so hiring, pay, performance, potential promotion are actually equitable before we make them. And if we do that, we will not only catapult you know, our time to gender equity, we will actually have more inclusive and better solutions for climate change. Thanks, Katika. Um, that really starkly puts the problem before us. We know what we need to do. So Virginie, turning again to you, what do you think are the key factors to make change happen within corporates? So I really believe that change is systemic. So it means that we all need to be involved in, the, in this change. So on one side, we have the government and the regulation. They can do a lot by implementing a framework. They put a framework and we have to uh, they set up a framework which uh, then will be uh, followed. And as the opposite, we have the individuals, and each one of us can have different actions in day-to-day -day life in order to change things. And in the middle, at the heart of the ecosystem, we have the corporates. And so the corporates are there to implement what comes from the regulation to give more consistency, to more transparency to, what they, to their actions, but also to be more inclusive. And there is a real strong call to work more with the non-profit organization because corporates alone cannot do everything. They have already a lot of pressure. And the non-profit organization cannot do everything neither because they don't have all the means. But all together, we can have action with pro bono action, for instance. And at Mazars, we do a lot of pro bono action with different associations in order to help people who want to do something on sustainability. And we work together, putting all our, str uh, our strengths together. So that's really key uh, to be a, a very performant. The second point is a transparency. Transparency is really uh, uh, has the capacity to change things. We have spoken a lot about greenwashing. So if we want to stop greenwashing, we need uh, different texts like the CSRD in France, but other texts coming from the, from the US on the same topic in order to be able to publish non-financial information at the same level and with the same uh, strength as the financial information. In order that to take decision, we will have both to take into consideration and not to decide just with financial information or non-financial information. They cannot be opposite. That's really key to avoid greenwashing. And we were discussing of trust. It's really very important uh, if we want to give trust. And finally, and that's what you were saying, difference between what we are saying and what we are doing, authenticity is key. So we need to walk the talk if we want to reinforce the trust again. So we can, uh, you can only expect what you can measure. So we need to go to scientific method in order to measure before communicating and not communicating before measuring. It's really key to reinforce this trust and to make change happen. Thanks, Virginie. Um, that, that topic of greenwashing is obviously, you know, at the forefront of people's minds and finding ways to really address sustainability goals, really promote them, really see um, action on them, measured action is, is something that I think is very welcome. But it's interesting that many corporates, you know, the ones who are most progressive and who really want to be leading are not just waiting for uh, regulations to come in, and CSRD, for example, is a great one that is going to really accelerate this for companies that operate in Europe, that have subsidiaries in Europe, etc. But companies are, are regularly signing up to voluntary goals, setting up best practices. Uh, for example, you know, SBDI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative that many companies are signing up to. So it's, it's a voluntary thing that they do, 
which then promotes best practices throughout their operations, which I think is, is very heartening to see. Um, let me move on to Fernanda to ask you some, a sl slightly different perspective on this. So do you think that these great expectations for corporate action have specific human rights angles as well? Absolutely. Um, well, I already mentioned one example, and I think there are many more. Let's, let's think of something very recent and, and close to all of us, which was the, the, the COVID-19 crisis. It was once in a time, a human rights, health, and, and social crisis. And despite urgent calls to ensure the equal distribution of vaccines, in 2021, pharmaceutical companies tragically failed to raise to the challenge. Instead, you know, they, they monopolized technology, blocked and lobbied against the sharing of intellectual property, chose to, 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 do, to prioritize supply to wealthy countries who sometimes had three times the number of their population when the vaccine was scarce. So they can cause a lot of bad impact and they can cause a, a very good impact in human rights. What you were saying about choosing to, to get voluntary um, measures to, to raise to the challenge is fantastic. And we welcome that because we also believe in how a good example gets followed. But we feel there's more to be done. The root cause of why some business can have a negative impact on human rights, on the environment, and get away with it, is the government, governance gaps that there are, thanks to globalization, the power, the power and imbalance that some big multinational companies have vis-a-vis -vis those states or even the communities that are affected by, by those impacts is huge. And if we don't close that power imbalance with some international regulation that brings us all together, then it's very difficult that we will achieve sustainable change in a systemic way that, that Virginie was uh, speaking about. Um, there's another very concrete way that, that a, a companies can have a negative human rights impact. You may have noticed that I am not mentioning the names of the companies in the examples I gave, and this is not an oversight, it's intentional. It's because we can be sued for defamation. And even though Amnesty International did their research and very diligently documented the cases, which by the way, you can find in amnesty.org, I will spend a lot of time and energy defending against these lawsuits. And imagine if I were a woman from Colombia, an, an indigenous woman from Colombia, I wouldn't have the means to defend. And this is another very concrete example. There's a broad study in the Business and Human Rights Resource Center about what is called a strategic lawsuits against public participation, SLAP. And this is a tactic to silence. Uh, and it's, it's very real. It's a, it happens in every region in the world. So what I think companies that are in this forum and are committed to change need to do is to find out who those companies are this encourage this practice, create incentives against this, because this needs to stop. Thanks, Fernanda. That's a very powerful message. Thank you. Because we're at the Global Women's Forum, um, we've already touched on some of these issues, but I'd like to explore a bit more the gender dimensions to the expectations. And maybe, Virginia, if I start with you, you could talk about the things that you are doing to promote gender equity within Mazars itself and the things that you are doing to help your employees and staff to really contribute, because I think it's quite interesting to hear how corporates are, are approaching this. So yes, we have a, a large program on, uh, on gender diversity because we, we really want to onboard all the best talents. For us, it's key. We, we sell professional services. It means that we keep people who are able to deliver services. So we need the, the best ones. So uh, we have always, or very, from a very, very long time, uh, hired half, half, half women and half men. And at the highest level, so at the level of partners, uh, 10 years ago, we were just 10%. So it's very, very low. 
Now we are around 30% in France, a bit less in the group because it's more difficult to organize it on a global basis and a country basis. We are nearly 30% in which that we have implemented different programs in order to keep people with us, to work with the young generation in order that they feel well with, with mothers and that they, they stay. So we have programs of mentoring. We have lots of things around maternity leaves and paternity leaves also because it's very, very important to have balanced program in order that uh, we onboard everybody. So men also need to feel uh, comfortable wa with what we are doing in order not to create discrepancies or, or kind of concerns for them. So uh, that's why our program for some of them are for all of us and some are just for women because we need that uh, they are working in a, in a world where there are more, more men than that. So that we, we are always working with the, um, the ideas of all the, all the staff, all the, all the people working at Mazar. They are contributing uh, to the ID and we co-construct uh, what we are doing in order that they feel really involved in what we are doing. Thanks, Virginie. Um, Katika, can you add to that and maybe talk a little bit about pipeline? Sure. Uh, so I think the, the, the first piece that I'll talk about before I really dive into what Pipeline does is that we actually started with research. So Pipeline started with research across 4,000 companies in 29 countries. And what we found was that for every 10% increase in intersectional gender equity, so gender plus race and ethnicity and age, there's a 1% to 2% increase in revenue. So it's not only the right thing to do, it's actually a massive economic opportunity. And CEO's uh, responsibility is to maximize shareholder value. So ensuring equity in their companies is a really important lever for them to pull. I talked about the key decisions that companies make that move uh, them toward equity. Just to give you a sense of that, the average Fortune 500 company has 60,000 employees, and they make three key decisions across their employees each year, which is performance, potential, and pay. So that's 180,000 opportunities to move toward equity each and every year. It's, it's 90 million across the Fortune 500. That's what we actually make possible. We created software that gets in front of the people decisions that companies make. So internal hiring, mobility, uh, which is something that comes up in, uh, particularly in economic downturns, pay, performance, potential, and promotion. So before those decisions are actually made, we ensure that they are in fact equitable. The two things that, a couple things that we found, we found a lot, but a couple things that we found uh, is that companies often talk about uh, closing the gender pay gap. And that's important, but it's actually just a baseline uh, because uh, pay is the symptom, it's not the disease. So in other words, pay is the quantitative value that companies place on their talent, but the actual value happens before that in performance and potential. So we use natural language processing that actually reads through performance reviews and call out, calls out bias phrases. So we find things like women's emotional state is commented on a lot more than men's. Uh, women are uh, held to account to demonstrate cultural values of the company a lot more than men. Women are also rewarded for doing unpaid work at work, so planning parties, outings, etc. Uh, ERGs, if, those, if you're not paying folks to participate in ERGs, that's another example. So these are examples of systemic biases that are unconscious for the most part, but actually seep into, uh, into the decisions that we make. The last thing that I will add, because you talked about representation, we've actually found that one of the other pieces that's really important uh, to add on to representation is a measure that we call span of control. So span of control is how many direct and indirect resources women versus men control. So you could feasibly have two vice presidents, one has a span of control of 700 people, one has a span of control of 200, and the one that has 700 has more upward mobility, visibility, and influence. And so we've actually found that on average, uh, men receive two resources for every one resource that women receive. 
So it's really important that we actually take essentially a scalpel to the data and ensure that we are actually talking about absolute equity, not performative, you know, performative equity, right? Which leads to things like tokenism, to you were only hired because you're a woman, which is completely insulting, but you know, those kinds of things. The last piece that I will add, um, and I talked about this in the first uh, uh, piece that I mentioned, which is that we actually find that uh, when companies implement the pipeline platform, that on average, because they're essentially shifting from inequitable by default to equitable by design, that they improve equity by 67% in the first three months on the platform. So the question isn't whether or not we can reach gender equity, it's whether or not we will choose to. Thank you, that's a really good call to arms. So, Virginie, we have about 12 minutes left. Um, how can corporates gain confidence and strengthen their sustainability actions? Given everything we've heard, how, how do they progress and accelerate? So I really believe it's just by engaging a deep cultural change. It's really a matter of culture, and uh, it's uh, at the heart of the pur purpose of the, uh, of the corporates. So first is to consider a different timeline. Corporates have been used to be in a quite short-term timeline because of the pressure of the financial market and uh, of the investors. Today, now, it's, it's about to be finished. So it means that they, they have to manage with still this demand, but also a need to go on a longer term uh, uh, timeline, in fact, in, in to consider things uh, with more sustainable uh, consideration. The second point is really to embed sustainability in the process, to create what I call the sustainability by design. We cannot still have just CSR in one department thinking of great strategy of what we could change, and then the rest of the corporate. No, it has be to be embedded in all the processes, in all the making decision process that's really key if we want to change in deep the things. I think that measuring is also key. So uh, by using scientific methods, you, you are discussing about the SBTI, for instance, it's very important to uh, restore this trust and to avoid what we were saying about greenwashing, because it will be, it will be very difficult to go uh, out of this greenwashing with, uh, which has been. So scientific methods uh, will help in order to give consistency to the information. And, and the last point, which is not the least, is to become bilingual financial and non-financial. So to put financial and non-financial exactly at the same level, and the regulation like CSRD will help on that, because you will have uh, the uh, corporate reporting with two lines, one on uh, the financial information and in the other one on the non-financial information. And they will be audited, which is great for us, because it's a very interesting topic for uh, our young talents to go on auditing on the non-financial information. And that's a key to give the same uh, weight to the uh, to information and to help in the uh, decision-making process to take it into consideration with consistency to be able to compare from one corporate to another and, uh, and to really believe in the information which is given. Thanks, Virginie. Um, so that's a really interesting you know, concept which more and more companies are going to need to be doing in order to respond to regulations but also in order to respond to the stakeholders um, that are valuing those companies, right? Um, I, I, I've heard, and I really like that, the, the phrase, you know, we want to move from inequitable by default to equitable by design. And you also use the phrase sustainability by design. There's a real intention, intentionality to making change, measuring where we are at, and then measuring the progress that it's being made. And this is all, you know, really encouraging to hear. I'm also hugely encouraged by um, the voices, the young voices that we hear in this conversation. So I was, I, while I was working at the kitchen table the other day, I overheard my young son, he's 11, 
talking about his investment portfolio with his dad, and they were talking about, you know, do we go for this fund which has this higher return, or do we go for this fund which has ESG goals and a slightly lower return historically? And for my son, there was no question, there was no hesitation. Of course, we should invest in the fund with the ESG goals and accept that we may get lower returns as a result, but there was absolutely no hesitation on his part. And so this is something that I think corporations are responding to as well, that investors of all ages are looking at these goals and how companies are reporting on them, how they are measuring them, how they are promoting actions to, to move the needle forward. Um, so on that note, um, we have a few minutes left, but what I'd like to do for all three of you is to ask you for one key recommendation that you would suggest to our audience members here and, and watching virtually to take away and implement in their daily lives or in their organizations. So Fernanda, I'm going to start with you. Your one key goal that you would like people to focus on. Okay, um, I think the one key goal will be to adopt due diligence processes that will uh, include the supply chain to understand the impact on the environment and on human rights of your business, but also of the business with, with which you are doing business with, including condemn the practice of threatening or, and harassing uh, human rights defenders, journalists, community leaders that are raising up their voices and instead supporting them, embracing them, because uh, more voices, more democratic uh, discussion, more transparency, as it was said before, it's, it's key also for, for a greater uh, future. Thanks, Fernanda. So do the diligence on your supply chain and make sure that you are promoting those suppliers who are using best practices and condemning those who are violating human rights and, and, and climate actions. Virginie, how about you? I would say uh, lay, let's play in the game of uh, making change happen. Let's do what you, what you can to make the sustainability by design be implemented in your day to day life, uh, whereas in your corporates or in your different organizations and even on a, in your personal side. We cannot, one person cannot change all, but all together we can change a lot. Thank you, Virginie. Thank you. Kaska. Uh, so, so I, you know, in addition to implementing pipeline, I, yeah. I will tell you that we actually historically, I, I do have an answer in addition to that, but, but we, we historically at Pipeline have worked with enterprise companies, so companies that have 10,000 employees or more. And we, at core, one of our core values obviously is equity for all. And so three weeks ago, we actually launched uh, um, a larger product so that companies with 200 or more employees can use the pipeline platform. So there, that, there were, therefore, we're actually reaching more and more companies, and we provide a free of charge equity baseline to any company who goes to our website. So you can go to our website and you can sign up for the free equity baseline. In addition to that, we need to move away from looking at equity, gender equity, as uh, only the right thing to do or a social issue. It is, in fact, a massive economic opportunity. I talked about the research that Pipeline did that showed that for every 10% increase in intersectional gender equity, there's a 1% to 2% increase in revenue. But we don't have a choice whether or not we pay for people. We have a choice about how we pay for them. And we can invest in equity and have a huge return, or we can pay for people on the back end. And I will just give you, because I know we have a little bit, I'll just give you some really key examples, which is that um, uh, in the United States, over 56% of children who are living in poverty are living in households headed by women. We could close the Social Security savings gap, which is a huge gap in the United States, by a third if we close the gender pay gap. And twice as many women versus men are, over the age of 65 are living in poverty. 
So we have the opportunity today to use advanced technology to actually ensure that we're investing in equity and we will reap the economic returns. And so we really need to really change this conversation from one of a social issue or the right thing to do to actually a massive economic opportunity. You talked about the returns that your son was looking at. Actually, historically, if you look at gender lens funds or any type of asset management regarding gender, so specific, like I'm a venture back founder, we actually return, we are a better investment than our male founders. We provide, right, we, right. we are a better investment. So if it, even if you don't care about gender equity, I know people here do, but even if you don't care about it, it's actually a massive economic opportunity. You will reap better returns. So it is a both and, it is not an either or. Thanks, Katika. That's a really, really wonderful message to hear. I think I would just finish with my own as well. Um, there is amazing energy in this room, in this conference, in these sessions. I think we all have a role to play. We've heard that we should. My call to arms is to make sure that you educate yourself. There are all these wonderful resources online that, that you educate yourself with the key statistics and that you can then speak up in your organizations and advocate for change with all of the stats that we've heard today all of the positive changes that can be made, the, po the positives that go right to the bottom line, which many people look at, even if they don't care about gender equity, um, and speak up. Be ready to speak up, be prepared, and don't be afraid to do so. So courage. And I think we'll wrap up there, if that's okay. Thank you so much, ladies. That was truly inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us today for that wonderful session.